The Bible is portrayed as the divine human handbook, perfect in its message and harmonious in its delivery. It discusses origins of the universe, this planet, the creation of humankind, and all living creatures on the earth. God, through the Bible, decrees to his creation what was right and wrong regarding hygiene, food consumption, agriculture, all the way to ethical and moral standards involving theft, rape, and murder. But as it is far from being the hallmark of equity and compassion, the Bible falls short in its treatment and valuation of women. In Old Testament times, God gave the children of Israel commandments and rules for their society and culture. As it relates to females, God delivered rules on how a woman was to be treated and valued. Adherents to these archaic divine decrees have used them to suppress women for thousands of years and continue to do so even in this seemingly enlightened era. Women in Israel were monetarily worth less than males. Females were possessed by their father, their betrothed, their husband, or their captors. Because of their subjection to man, accepting religious appointment, a woman was either a wife, a birthing vessel, or an outlet for sexual desire. A basic review of rape laws given in Deuteronomy conveys God's attitude towards females and how he wanted men to view women. If a woman was raped and not betrothed, the rapist owed her father money and she had to marry her rapist. However, if she was betrothed, the rapist was killed, but only because he despoiled the other man's possession. If the rape occurred in the city, both the rapist and the female victim were killed because it is assumed she did not cry out for help. If the rape occurred out of the city, out of earshot, only the rapist was killed because ostensibly no one could hear her cries for help. Consequently, if a female got raped, she had to literally scream for her life because if no one heard the screams, it's assumed that she bears guilt in this forced sex act. This speaks volumes concerning the real authorship of the Bible. It's ignorantly assumed that all rape victims can fight off their attacker or scream loud enough for someone to help them. This idea is indicative of someone who could not sympathize with the vulnerability and terrifying position in which a woman could find herself while being violently attacked, not the command of an all-knowing creator of women. In the following passage, the effects of God's valuation of women is clearly displayed in one of the most disturbing passages in the Old Testament concerning the rape of a priest's concubine. The priest, having been sexually propositioned by a mob, instead offered his concubine in lieu of his host's daughter. The concubine died in her subsequent sexual assault. After realizing the mob had killed her, the priest took her corpse home and cut it into twelve pieces that were delivered to the twelve tribes of Israel as a call to arms for the grievous act to which he had consented until he was deprived of his property. Who would offer up their daughter to be raped? Who would offer any woman to a mob of perverted men seeking to hurt, use, and abuse someone in such a violent, brutal way? You might take that action if you held the attitude that she was worth less than a male stranger in your home, as was the culture of the Israelites given to them by God. Things appear to get somewhat better for women in the New Testament. Husbands are instructed to love their wives as Christ loved the church, to the point that he gave his life for it. Christ also prevents the stoning of an adulteress, asking the mob to judge her as they would judge themselves before throwing the first stone. Further, we're told in the New Testament that we're all one in Christ, meaning there was no differentiation between race and gender but this seems to imply some special spiritual consideration that doesn't translate in the natural world because the New Testament goes on to command women to be in subjection to their husbands. They're not allowed to speak or participate in worship assemblies, even to the extent that they can't ask questions. If they have questions, they're to ask and learn through their husbands. Lastly, the New Testament extols the virtues of holy women, such as Sarah, who obeyed and addressed her husband as Lord, demonstrating at least submission and at worst subservience to her husband. Now let's take a look at some common rationalizations for the poor treatment and valuation of women. The Bible places a lower monetary value on women. Some Christians have proposed that Leviticus 27 indicates that a female is worth less monetarily in Jewish culture based on her ability to do work in God's service and be a productive member of their society. 
However, Leviticus 12, 2 through 5 states that the mother who has just given birth to a female remains unclean in the blood of her purification twice as long as when she gives birth to a male. What sort of reasoning is there for twice the duration? Is she twice as unclean for having a girl? Is it because baby boys don't need as much protection from the elements in their first month of life? Current science indicates that female newborns are hardier than their male counterparts. Given that there's no scientific need for a longer duration for females, why was her uncleanness twice as long? Undeniably, there are some beautiful passages in the Bible about women. However, you can't ignore the heinous ones in order to paint a more palatable picture. Since hindsight is always 2020, we as fallible humans and a progressive society can look back in history and see that the views of women and their subsequent treatment was wrong, even though no one in the culture at that time thought so. Additionally, we can look at Middle Eastern countries now and see that their current treatment of women is wrong, even though those submersed in that culture today cannot. There are two points we'd like to make here. Number one, the Abrahamic God is credited in the Bible for establishing the culture that is still thriving today in the Middle East, and it is a culture and belief system that we as outsiders can look at today and see is wrong with regard to women. Number two, reason and compassion indicates that women differ physically and emotionally from men, but are no less equal and deserve to be regarded as such. If the God of the Bible commands otherwise, then reason and compassion can expose him as wrong and unjust. What that Levite did to his concubine in the book of Judges, and also the similar fate that Lot proposed for his own daughters in Genesis, was possible because of the attitude that God established in their culture. It was unthinkable in their minds that a male should be defiled in such a way, but if a woman is defiled, it's not so bad because God already decreed that in such cases, she can just marry her rapist and at least be fed and have the good fortune of bearing children to the monster that raped her. But woe to the man that rapes a woman that is betrothed or married. Then and only then will the rapist pay with his very life. How would any man in that time view a rape victim in that context? Throwing a woman to the wolves to be raped to save yourself or a fellow male suddenly makes more sense when you were taught by God regarding rape and its consequences. After all, this is the same God that allowed the men of Israel to commit genocide in Canaan with the exception of virgins that caught their eye. God told the warriors to take them for yourselves, and after shaving her head, clipping her nails, burning her clothes, and letting her mourn her murdered family, he could go into her as her husband, and if she ended up not making him happy in the long run, he could turn her out. After having taken the one thing that she had left that could have given her some leverage or return her virginity, the only thing that made her worth anything at that time. Some Christians suggest that maybe God gave the Israelites rules that were specific to that time because they weren't ready for such progressive attitudes. Why would the God of the universe constrain his revelation of right and wrong to man based on the culture of the times? Does that mean right and wrong is relative to cultural bias or that cultural sensibilities hold sway over what's right? Are you saying that people weren't ready for doing the right thing? Or further, was God not capable of delivering very controversial teachings that would go against the grain of cultural norms regarding women? So, instead of giving them laws that were right in this area, he gave them laws that were wrong in order to work around the local culture? Instead of decreeing laws that would ensure justice and true protection of women and victims, he decreed unjust laws so that the unethical treatment of women could be perpetuated for thousands of years? On the contrary, it seems more likely that mortal men in that culture and in that time who were unable to see the injustice of their attitude and treatment of women wrote the Bible, not the creator of the universe, a creator who would know right from wrong and would be capable of imparting impartial and just laws concerning women. In conclusion, how do you reconcile God's evaluation and treatment of women in the Old Testament and how contemporary Christians value them? Using all applicable scripture as evidence, is it reasonable to assume that a perfect, just, and compassionate deity with ultimate authority to instill irreproachable truth regardless of historical culture delivered imperfect, unjust, and cruel rules? Or is it more reasonable to believe that a fallible, 
contemporaneous man authored such inept ideas regarding the treatment of women.